Hello everyone, today's video is about counted thread work or counted embroidery publications. That is to say publications that I love and that I use and that I have in my stash. Counted thread work is my jam really, it's in my wheelhouse of things that I can do. I find that there's a little bit of difficulty there, it stretches me, it challenges me, but it doesn't scare me as much as sort of surface embroidery does. Um, so I thought I'd talk through the different um, publications that I have, two magazines and four books. And obviously some of you watching might be, um, might have been stitching counted thread embroidery for many years. Some of you might be new stitchers or you're looking to sort of stretch yourself a bit from just cross stitch. Obviously cross stitch is a type of counted thread work embroidery, but there are many other um, variations and types of thread work that you can do that's still counted. So I always find you've still got the safety of knowing where to place your stitches, but you can sort of branch out from cross stitch if you want to, if that's something that you're looking to do. So whichever category you're in, I hope you enjoy this video. It has the potential to be quite long. So if I were you, I would either grab a beverage or grab your stitching. And um, I've got plenty of things here to show you, so um, I'll get on with it. So first of all, um, as I mentioned, the first two things I wanted to talk about are magazines. Now, some of you who have watched my videos, um, my old videos, might remember I had a little rant about UK cross-stitch magazines in my, um, I think it was my stitching journey video. So we're not going to go there again. Suffice it to say that I don't find that UK cross-stitch magazines um, are catered for my particular taste. Having said that, I do know, obviously, that Jamie Chalmers, um, Mr X-Stitch, Mr Cross-Stitch, however you need to say it, has, he, I think it was, was it Kickstarter funded or something like that? Anyway, he has published um, a new cross-stitch magazine. I think it's on issue four. And I'd be really interested to hear if any of you guys have purchased that magazine and had a look through it. I know it's kind of fibre artist, embroidery artist led, but I really love that type of thing. The only thing is, I'm not quite sure if s some of the things in there might be a little edgy for my blood, but I don't know. So I'd be really interested to hear if anybody's um, got an opinion on that magazine, if you think it might be something that I would like. I would definitely look into it. Um, at the moment, I haven't um, gone and bought bought any of the sort of the current copy or the back issues, but I really appreciate anybody's opinions on that particular magazine. But the two magazines I'm going to talk about um, will come as no surprise, especially if you've, if you've seen all the videos on my channel. The first one is the Gift of Stitching magazine. The second one is Sampler and Antique Needlework Quarterly. They are both magazines that I stitch from fairly regularly. There are lots of projects that I finished that were from both of those publications. Now the Gift of Stitching magazine, unfortunately, I genuinely don't think is available any longer. The magazine was published as a digital publication between um, February 2006 up right up until um, May, June 2012. I was a subscriber to the magazine um, for the last couple of years that it was in publication and then I bought the back issues of the magazines. Now for a while Kirsten Edwards, um, the editor, the publisher of um, the magazine, um, had back issues of the magazines available both singularly and also um, on a CD. I think you could buy various years worth um, of the magazines. But I remember seeing a few months ago, uh, whether it was on Instagram or somewhere else, that she was sort of advertising it would be the last gasp opportunity to purchase um, the magazines for whatever reason. Obviously, she has to move on, do different things. So that's fair enough. So if any of you um, have the you know back issues, back catalogue of the Gift of Stitching magazine, I really hope that you actually stitch things from it because it was a fantastic and still is to me a fantastic resource of a magazine and when I came across it I was thrilled because like I say I was sick to death of no offense to anybody who likes UK cross stitch magazines we are all entitled to our own opinion um, but I just they they really weren't for me and to discover a magazine that used um, different techniques and different threads spoke about threads that I'd not heard of um, also included designers work 
that I had heard of, these designers were known to me. Um, what I'll do is I'll put um, a couple of a few pictures up um, showing you the, some a flavour of the different designs that were featured in the magazine. So there were designers such as Ink Circles, Little House Needleworks, Elizabeth Almond and her Blackwork designs, um, Reflets de Soir, obviously, I'm stitching um, my red work sampler is from um, the Gift of Stitching magazine. Even Chatelaine, the romantic um, rose mandala you might have seen that Martina designed originally, that was only available and only published through the Gift of Stitching magazine. So that kind of shows the calibre of designs and designers that were featured in that magazine. And alongside that, there was really interesting articles about threads, history of needlework, um, interviews with the designers. There was like so much to learn in that magazine and it's where I learned so many things. As I mentioned, different techniques. So you had cross stitch, lots of speciality stitches, hard anger, um, black work. There was even one issue that had sort of gold work in and um, it always gave you the finishing instructions, how to finish the ornaments and things like that. It was a fabulous um, magazine. The designs in it were large and small, um, so it's catered for all tastes. Um, but I just, I just really love that magazine and it is such a shame although I can completely understand why um, it had to sort of come to an end. Anyway, things things naturally do um, take their course, but it was just such a great magazine and such a great resource. And um, I've stitched, as I said, I've had lots of fun stitching so many designs um, from that particular magazine and it introduced me to new threads and new designers that I'd not heard of before. So. That was a fantastic magazine. So if you ever, if any of those, any of that sounds interesting to you, if you ever come across the opportunity to purchase the whole set of the magazines on CD, as um, Kirsten was originally selling them, or or, or um, single issues, if she ever decides to sort of offer them again, then I would strongly urge you to take advantage of that because they were fantastic. Um, the other magazine, Saint Fleur Antique Needlework Quarterly, I have all... Um, three of the DVDs. Some of them um, I got from Patrick Rabbit in the UK. Obviously, if you're based elsewhere, you may be able to source them somewhere closer to you. One of them I think I got from Amazon. So it's basically the entire back catalogue of the magazine. There's um, the first volume contains every issue between 1991 to 2000, and that's um, 21 issues on that DVD. The second one contains 40 issues of the magazine, that's from 2001 to 2010. And the final one is 2011 to 2015, and that contains 19 issues. And they were published quarterly, as the name suggests, so there's four issues um, per year. But again, um, fabulous magazine, learnt so much, looking through all the back issues of this. Lots of samplers I want to stitch. Obviously, it's catering for the antique um, needlework. Some of them are reproductions. Some of them are sort of inspired by antique sampler designs, such as the case of Band Sampler, which I'm currently stitching, as you might have seen in my currently stitching video. Um, again, not just patterns, a lot of articles about the history of the specific samplers that were being reproduced, about the history of needlework tools, materials, fabrics. So if you, like me, are really interested in the history of needlework, history of embroidery, again, a phenomenal resource really. And so many patterns to keep you going and keep you interested. Hopefully I've remembered as I've been talking to put up some pictures of some of the samplers um, that I particularly picked out that I want to stitch. There's a range in there, obviously some of them are straightforward cross stitch, others include um, more um, drawn thread work, um, more speciality stitches, so it caters to a complete range of um, likes, hopefully a complete range from sort of beginner right the way up to the more sort of experienced advanced stitcher. Now I do appreciate that antique samplers are not everybody's cup of tea and that's absolutely fine. For a while I didn't really understand the sort of fascination that people had with, re with stitching reproduction samplers. I completely admired the work that went into them and, and that side of things but there wasn't the sort of desire within me to stitch one until I came across one particular design and I think it might be true um, for designs 
like similar to heaven and earth designs and chatelaine designs you might not want to stitch every single one out there but you want to find your almost holy grail design from their particular um range or of patterns and i kind of felt a bit that way i was i decided that i did actually want to stitch a reproduction sampler as not necessarily as a challenge because the one i picked wasn't particularly difficult to stitch but just just to say that I'd stitch one, but I wanted to find one that I I loved that I loved every aspect of. Sometimes I find there's some motifs I don't like, or I love the motifs in the sampler, but I don't like the verse that's included. I know I could change these things, uh, but I wanted to find one that I just loved and just desperately wanted to stitch, which I did. Back in 2016, I scoured reproduction sampler sites and. Uh, obviously one of those was the scarlet letter and I decided to stitch a flame stitch and that was basically um, what got me hooked on reproduction samplers and reading about them and the whole history behind them. I just think it's it's fascinating that hundreds of years later we're still stitching the same thing as women stitched all those centuries ago that there is somehow a common thread that does actually link us all and when you actually see the original an original antique sampler in the flesh and you admire the immense handiwork and skill that's gone into it it is amazing but then you remember it might be the case that you're looking at an antique sampler that's been stitched by a 10 year old girl and you look at the work that's gone into it and and it's just amazing and you remember that they didn't have a daylight lamp to stitch by. They were stitching on small counts of linen, probably by candlelight. And yet they still produced amazing work. And there we are, hundreds of years later, with our daylight lamps, with our magnifiers, with our iPads stitching. And But we're stitching the same thing that they did. So I, I just sort of love the, that sort of element of it. Um, obviously I totally appreciate you might completely think stitching a reproduction sampler is just not your thing and that's fine but um, just so I have an excuse to show this one because it has not yet been unveiled on YouTube and my stitching it doesn't really get to see the light of day very much so I thought I would just shoehorn in even though it's not from Sampler and Antique Needlework Quarterly magazine I would just shoe in the reproduction sampler that I've done so here is um, Flame Stitch and it wasn't until I got this one out to show you guys that I remembered how much I totally love stitching this project. And it's stitched on 35 count um, Flober in cream, which is a brilliant fabric um, to stitch on. I really enjoy stitching on it. The slubs on it aren't quite, it's got the, it's a linen mix. So it doesn't quite have all the slubs that linen can do. So it's very easy. Um, to see the holes on the fabric if you're stitching on a small account. And the whole thing is stitched in, obviously, a Vera Soir, Soir d'Alge silk, so that was another pull for stitching this particular piece. Um, obviously, I don't, I no longer have the chart. I believe it is currently with a very good stitchy friend of mine who's in Venice. So I can't show you the chart, but the, the charts from quite a lot of the um, reproduction sampler designers are fantastic in themselves as a lot of you know if you stitch reproduction samplers scarlet letter charts hands across the sea needlework charts needlework press all their charts you know are lovely and to treasure i just parted with mine because i knew i wouldn't stitch it again and i knew the stitch it went to would appreciate it um but yeah this one wasn't was a complete joy to stitch Despite the fact there are seriously, well not seriously, that's an exaggeration, there are like 11 billion eyelets in this. So the whole of, uh, let's see, it's hard to hold up. The whole of these bands, all Algerian eyelets, and every stitch in this band, all Algerian eyelets. So, you know, that got a bit tedious after a while. But I just love this section at the bottom. Wow penultimate band the what this one here with the with which is obviously where the name flame stitch comes from that's flame stitch or um i never know how to say this is it bargello or bargello i don't know but don't shoot me i'm sure somebody will probably tell me in the comments um but yeah so that's my reproduction sampler 
I loved it and it basically started an obsession with them. Um, so yeah, if like me, you love, I can't imagine why you wouldn't already have those um, DVDs if you do love um, reproduction samplers. But if it's just something you're getting into, um, if you're a new stitcher and you like the look of reproduction samplers, you might not have heard of that magazine because obviously it, it ceased publication in 2015. Um, so definitely, if you're into reproduction samplers, definitely get um, those um, DVDs because there will be a wealth of patterns on there that you will want to stitch. So um, one of the things I did make sure of um, with the, the magazines and one thing that I have found useful from sort of when I started Operation Threadporn back in 2015, I was really making the effort, well, I was stitching from stash. And that was something that I have since carried on doing. So 2016, I stitched from stash. Had I gone on to stitch in 2017, I would have also stitched from stash. And it is still something um, that I am doing with current projects. Now I've taken up um, stitching again. I think I've only bought less than a handful of charts in that time because I have so much to stitch. And one of the things that I find helps me to remember the charts that I have, because that's the problem, isn't it? You might be like me and have sort of magpie syndrome. You see something new and shiny. You forget about what you've got already. You just want the newness. You want the new thing, the new shiny thing. So what I did to help me to stitch from stash and to focus on that is um, both with my PDF charts and also the charts that I wanted to stitch from both the Gift of Stitching magazine and Stamp Sampler and Antique Needlework Quarterly. Both are obviously digital PDF um, copies of the magazines is I created private Pinterest boards. And what I did is I took the photographs of the finished project, not the chart, and I created a, a Pinterest board for my personal PDF, um, PDF charts that I bought. So ones from Northern Expressions Needlework, my Chatelaines, um, my Mabel Figworthy Hardanger charts, you know, all of those things, because the majority of the charts I've got are PDF. And also I did the same thing actually, thinking about it, from my hard copy chart. So I took a picture of the chart, I found a picture um, of the finished um, article um, on the internet somewhere and I pinned it um, to a private Pinterest board so only I can see it. It was for my eyes only. And I did that, as I said, for the Gift of Stitching magazine as well, any projects I wanted to stitch from that and also sample and antique needlework quarterly. So it meant that any time I was sort of itching to stitch something new, my first protocol was Pinterest. And then when I saw something new and shiny, I thought to myself, do I love it more than the things I've got here? No, I don't. I'm really excited and happy to be stitching these things. So that's just something that I do personally, which might help somebody out there if it's something that they've not thought of doing. But I think visually seeing, it's hard when everything's on your hard drive, you forget what you've got, you genuinely do. Um, but having a physical um, picture, a reminder, it's not physical, it's digital, but, but having that in front of you makes you um, acknowledge what you already have and to find joy in that rather than um, newness. Although newness is fun, but you get where I'm going with this, especially if you're, you know, going, if your stash is, uh, acquisition is beyond your life expectancy, then it's just best to make a note of what you have and try and work through that. At least that's, that's what I do. Everybody's different, aren't they? So going from talking about antique reproduction samplers segues nicely into the first book um, that I'm going to show. Um, if you are a hardcore reproduction sampler stitcher or if you have any interest at all um, in counted thread work, I am pretty sure you probably have this book in your stash because it is, because it is by far the most definitive publication you can find on counted thread work. A stitch guide, project guide, all of those things. And it is... This one, The Proper Stitch Guide by Darlene Osteen. And it is, oh my goodness, it's just, you need this in your life. If you stitch counter thread work, if you stitch reproduction samplers, any type of sampler, if you do speciality stitch work, you need this book. It, it, it's that simple. What I'll do, I'm not going to show um, a lot of the book. There's plenty of um, pictures and things on um, Google. But what I will do is I um, now, I will put up a picture of the contents page. So at least you can see the things that are covered in this book and you'll be hard pushed to find another publication that covers everything as well as this one. So you can see from the table of contents 
that it starts at the top with the stitching technique, the best way to go about um, beginning your stitching, how to prepare your, sti your fabric and things like that. And then it basically breaks down all the counted um, threadwork stitches into families. So you've got the cross stitch family, you've got the straight stitch family, you've got the satin stitch family, so stitches like um, eyelet stitch, satin stitch, cloister blocks, um, if you're doing a sort of hardanger style um, design. Then you've got the buttonhole stitch family, joy. And another one of my favourites, the loop stitch family, joy. And then you've got a whole chapter on drawn thread techniques. And then, one of the most exciting things is, as well as being um, a stitching guide, a stitching tutor on how to do those various stitches, there are actually three projects included with the book. So the chart, um, charts and everything included in the book at the back, where you can actually put into practice um, the techniques mentioned in the book. So when you look at the um, charts, it will refer you, when it says what stitches um, to do, it will refer you back to a certain page so that you can see exactly the stitches that you'll be using. And I will put up a picture of each of the samplers, the finished samplers that are in, included in this book, the charts are included in this book. Because I was trying to, when I was doing research on potentially purchasing this book a few years ago, I couldn't really find easily pictures of what the completed samplers look like. Um, so the first sampler is the proper stitch sampler. The second one is the Tudor Rose sampler. And the third one that's in here is called the Pinks sampler. And I already have one of those kitted up, but we'll get to that in a moment. But one of the things, wow, well, there's so much I, I love in this book. I really can't say enough fantastic things about it. But um, I do think that you can also get it on um, on CD as well as in hard copy. But one thing I, I think there were, there was a time where you could get it when it was spiral bound. And that would be awesome because I'm not very... I, I don't like cracking the spines of books and bending them out of shape and things, so my husband always laughs at me because when I'm reading fiction books, if they're brand new, I'm like one of those annoying people that sort of read them like that without, you know, cracking the spine. I can't bear that. So my books look like new, but they, but they have been used. I'm just a very careful and obsessive user, but there we go. But things in this book that are amazing and fantastic is it is very comprehensive, but the diagrams in it are really clear. And the other thing that is unique I think about this book is that it shows you in diagram form what stitches should look like on the front but also what they should look like on the back of your work. I know personally sometimes I fudge speciality stitches so they do look right on the front but I know I haven't stitched them properly because they're not looking right on the back. Obviously not everybody is going to see the back and it's not that important but obviously if you're stitching a reversible sampler which blows my mind then obviously it's important that the back looks like the front. Um, but anyway, it's just good practice um, to get into doing the stitches um, correctly. So the diagrams are second to none. The there's also sort of hints and tips that show at points where you might go wrong or how to correct mistakes in your work, things like that. Um, yeah, it's just fantastic. Seriously, if you don't have this book and you do count your thread work, you, you need this book in your life. I can't say it enough. So the project that I have kitted up from this already, I kitted it up a couple of years ago in the hope that I would do it last year, but obviously things happened and I didn't really stitch. But the one I'll be doing is the Tudor Rose sampler, which is, from my point of view, very obvious. You know, it's got Tudor in the title, I love history, love the Tudors, blah, blah, blah. So I will eventually probably stitch the other two as well, but I plumped for um, the Tudor Rose initially. So that's all the materials in there. It will be stitched on 32 count um, linen. I think that's what was stipulated in the uh, in the pattern on in the chart on the book. I could have, I suppose. No, there was a reason I didn't use 40 count, and it would be for the drawn thread work because that would have freaked me out. So um, again, I've kitted this one up in Overa Soir Sardelle silks. The other threads that I use are pearl thread and number 12 for parts of the drawn thread work and this diddy, diddy little thread here, which I'm still not quite sure what it is. I think it's like a tatting thread. I had to get it from a, a specialist thread shop that I thankfully found on the internet because I bought um, some other threads that, from them that you'll see in a moment. Um, but the other threads that are of interest in this one that I haven't used before are these um, Krennic threads. They're um, Krennic um, Japan threads. So I've not used those before. 
There'll probably be a nightmare, but it'll be fine. There's not a lot that I can't, I can't stitch with. I'll whinge a lot, but I'll make do. Yeah, so that's really exciting, and I am really looking forward to um, stitching that piece. What I plan on doing when I do start it is using it as sort of almost like a learning sampler, by which I mean I obviously don't need to learn how to cross stitch and do how to do other speciality stitches because I've done them many times, but I want to take my time and try and produce almost my best work. Sounds odd. I mean, it's not the type of project that I want to sit down in front of the TV and, and mindlessly stitch on. I want to read you know, the guidelines, the instructions for how to stitch the stitches, even if it's a stitch that I've done many times, I want to try and make it the finished piece as good as I can. So in that sense, I want to make it more of a special project that I take my time with and that I don't rush through. So hopefully um, I'll be starting that one once I've finished a few of my current um, whips. I've already finished one, obviously finished Alice. I think the next one I want to finish, or hopefully will finish, is the band sampler. After that, it will be the Mirabilia, and then after that, I'd pro I'll probably finish the Redwork sampler before I will the Heaven and Earth design. So once I'm down to possibly the big um, Reflex de Soir sampler and the Heaven and Earth designs, then I might introduce some of these things, because I am missing doing... Um, something a bit more involved at the moment everything is cross stitch and it's the first time for a long time that I've had just cross stitch um, whips in um, in my rotation such as it is obviously coming back to stitching I wanted to ease myself in but now I'm thinking especially after sort of preparing for this video and looking at these books I'm just like I want to stitch all the things but I will uh, endeavour not to do that. So yeah, that's the proper stitch a must buy, in my opinion, basically. Um, obviously, as per usual, all the links for anything I've spoken about in this video will be down below. Um, so if you want to um, have a further look at any of the things I talk about, you'll find the links there. So the next um, three books, there's only three books um, left, are all written by the same person. I love them all. They are amazing, amazing books. The research and the attention to detail that have gone into them is phenomenal in my opinion and they just tick every single box for me. And the chances are if you do counted various different types of counter thread work embroidery you would have come across her work. These aren't the only books that she's written. They're the three most recent ones, I think. She has others, which I don't have, but I can see ending up in my collection. And the person that I'm talking about is um, Yvette Stanton. And here are the three books that I have of hers. Um, so the oldest one I have is the um, Sardinian Knotted Embroidery. Then the next one is the Early Style Hardanger book. And then the most recent one that I got in the post last week is this one. I have no idea how to say that word. I want, I think it might be smurg or something like that. But we'll just go with Norwegian pattern darning for the moment. That's what we'll stick to because I don't want to offend any Nordic people. These books though, awesome. Um, they are all as I said, phenomenally researched. It, and the photographs in them, everything is just brilliant. They're laid out in exactly the same way, each of them, um, despite being about a different um, regional embroidery. So I, I love that fact. I know exactly what I'm getting um, when I buy one of um, Yvette's books. And I won't show you, I won't be showing you very much from inside the books. Um, I don't want to make anybody angry about copyright and things like that. But what I will show you for each of them, and hopefully it won't be a problem, is I will show you the contents page so you can see exactly what's included in them. And I will show you the, the one project from each that I plan on stitching fairly soon, she says. So starting with um, the oldest one, the Sardinian Knotted Embroidery. I've now put up a picture of the contents page. And as I say, 
the layout for all of um, these three books, at least anyway, of Yvette's are the same. So you have to start with a short history um, of the, the region where the embroidery comes from and of the embroidery type itself. Then you have the projects. So each book comes with projects that range from basic, so a small project, so you can sort of um, start out right the way up to really involved projects. There's one of them, I think, um, perhaps this one, and all of them actually, where you can even make like a garment. There are pa there's the pattern to do like the the um, sort of cough, cuffs, cuffs, cuffs and collars, or um, on a garment and things like that. But she, if it actually gives you the whole pattern to make the complete garment, which is beyond me, I can barely sew on buttons. But we, I, I can sew on buttons. But the whole idea of dressmaking just blows my mind. But anyway, so you can see there the um, list of the pro the projects there. And then the next section after that is, is the biggest section, and that's where she talks about the techniques. So the stitch diagrams, again, are fantastic, very clear, very easy to follow. And the other thing that I think is unique about Yvette's books is that I think she, don't quote me, but I have the feeling she must be a left-handed stitcher because um, in all three of these books and her subsequent and her other publications, when it comes to the act getting down to the nitty gritty, how to stitch the stitch, she has directions for left-handed embroiderers and right-handed embroiderers. So if you are a left-handed embroiderer who gets frustrated and can't follow the directions because a lot of the times the instructions are written for a right-handed person, then Yvette Stanton is the person to look to. I think she's also, I don't have them myself, but I know she has published um, embroidery companions for both the right-handed stitcher and the left-handed stitcher. They might be a bit like gold dust now, but if you are a left-handed stitcher and you do get frustrated in that way, it might be worth um, seeking that out. Um, so yeah, so as I said, instructions, phenomenal. The other thing that she does that's so helpful is when things go wrong mistakes to look out for, um, how to correct them, hints and tips, that kind of thing. And, and I just find that so, so helpful. You really feel like somebody is talking you through how to do it step by step. So in this particular book, the project that I picked out, I'll put up a picture of it now, is the very first one, which is the Petite Doily. It's the smallest, um, well, it's not the smallest actually, but it, it's the of the smaller projects, it's the one that I, I um, wanted to stitch. The other good thing about this particular, um, the materials you need to complete the designs in this book is that basically it is um, white even weave fabric and DMC pearl threads in a number eight and a number 12, which most people can come by easily. I should think uh, I've got tons of skeins and skeins of white DMC pearl. Um, so sometimes when you're looking to branch out and do something different, you don't want to go down the route of spending a lot of money if it's not something you want to get into necessarily. But a lot of the time, a lot of you may well have um, those materials in your stash already. So there's no need for that. It's just getting hold of the book. Um, I think I got my copy on Amazon. Um, so yeah. I'm really looking forward to doing that. It is a bit of a, <laughs> the stitch that's basically, this embroidery is done um, using the same stitch, it's coral knot stitch. I'm sure I have had a project where I have used that stitch, but for the life of me, I can't think of which one it was, otherwise I would have dug it out and showed you. But coral knot stitch is a, isn't, isn't a funny one, but obviously it's a knotted stitch. I'm not good with those, I'm not good with loop stitches, but it's an unusual stitch in that, um, all of the work on it is basically done on the front of the fabric so you don't actually when you turn um, your work over there's nothing to see there's hardly there's no sort of stitching on the back um, so it's unusual in that way so I'm looking forward to um, getting to grips with that the other thing um, about Yvette's books which is brilliant um, I've talked through the order of them but the thing that she does do is there's a separate sheet of the patterns at the back in um, a plastic, little plastic wallet. So it keeps them um, clean. Um, obviously you're, you're not having to um, keep a book open all the time. They're on a flat sheet. They're big pieces of paper because 
they have like the templates templates as I mentioned for like shirts and smocks and dresses and things like that so they're almost like the, they're the size of dressmakers patterns basically but they also will have um, the little designs on there as well integrated within them um, so yeah that's the Sardinian knotted embroidery the next one is obviously one of my favorites for stitchers and um, watching this that might be a new subscribers not familiar with um, my channel haven't seen any of my other videos welcome by the way one of my very favourite um, techniques, um, counter threadwork techniques, is hardanger, which I'm sure, I say hardanger all the time, but I'm pretty sure that's not how um, a Norwegian person would say it. So again, I apologise for my anglicisation of, of everything. Um, I haven't done any hardanger for such a long time. And so I've dug out two pieces that I, the last two pieces that I did really, to remind you and myself, myself more importantly that I can do hard anger and not to be scared to pick it up again so these are two pieces of hard anger just in case you're not familiar with it um this one I think this is the biggest piece that I've done to date it's not a very good background to show you the cut work on really but this one is um, called Confetti of Hardanger. It's by Abby Gurdon, the same designer that did the Tree of Stitches, um, Summer Tree of Stitches. You might have seen those on my channel before or on my Instagram. And it was a part work. It was basically sort of a learning sampler, really. You Each each month, um, you got a different part to do, different piece of cut work and, and things like that. So it broke it down into small, manageable chunks. It wasn't looking at the whole pattern and thinking, oh, my goodness. I'm overwhelmed I can't do it um so yeah I learned tons doing this um particular sampler there were things that I shied away from doing with hard anger for a long time so there were all sorts of different filling stitches that I did with that one and um the threads that I used obviously um number eight and number 12 pearl this is stitched on 28 count even weave and the colors you can see are Alaskan beauty um which is a Jodry design thread but the pearl version so that would be number eight and number 12 and also a solid DMC in a lilac -y colour. So that's one piece of hard anger I've done a long time ago. So I'm hoping that I won't get freaked out when it comes to picking up hard anger again after sort of a, a year or, or 18 months of not doing it. And this is another design. Again, as you can't see it very well with the fancy uh, coloured drawers in the background. Um, but this one is a little Victoriana, the design's called, and it's by Loopy Loo Designs. And as you can, you might be able to see, let's put a bit of white behind it. The, you can see the cut work there, that's lots and lots of um, Greek crosses all together. And the thread I used in that one would be, um, it would be Ecru coloured pearl, 8 and 12. And the coloured variegated thread that you can see is a silk thread by Jojo Designs, which is now discontinued, I think, called Brighton Beach. So those are two examples of hard anger that I've done in the past. Um, stitchers that have known my work for a long time know that I, although traditionally hard anger is white on white, I always like to add a bit of colour and stuff in the hard anger that I've done in the past. However, having said that, this book is the traditional um, early style hard anger, all white on white, although obviously you can change that. And I love this book. The work that's gone into it, the patterns, you know, the photography, the archive of everything is, you know, the archives that Yvette has delved into to get the information is amazing. I can't, if you love, if you love Hardanger, you need this book if you don't already have it. Again, exactly the same as with the Sardinian Knotted Embroidery. Same layout, so I'll put up the um, contents page again as I did previously so you can see. Exactly the same layout, so it starts with the... Um, History of hard anger embroidery, where it's from, comparing old and new, that's an excellent section. Materials and equipment, and then it goes through the projects. I think there's 10, 10 or 11 projects in this book. And then it goes through the stitches and the techniques. The project that I have kitted up for this book, from this book, is the bookmark. So I'll put up a picture of that now, so you can see that one. The other interesting thing about this book is it kind of turns everything you thought you knew about Hardanger on its head. Um, or should I say everything I thought I knew about Hardanger? Because this is talking about the traditional Norwegian Hardanger, where it comes from. 
Hardanger originally would never have been stitched on a 22 count fabric. That apparently was something the companies made up to get people to stitch Hardanger, I think, because it's stitched on very fine counts of linen. So the projects in this book are on sort of 36 count all the way up to 50 count, which is quite frightening, the thought of doing cut work on 50 count. Um, but yeah. And the threads. The threads are the interesting thing. One of the things that I really appreciated that Yvette did in this book, and also the next book that I'm going to show you, is um, she recommends specific threads. It's Londonderry linen thread, because traditionally Hardanger was actually stitched with linen thread. I've not stitched with linen thread before, obviously cotton and silk, that's what I normally stitch with, so that was exciting. The other thing that is so fun is trying to source these threads. It can be frustrating if you can't find them, but I was fortunate enough that there was um, a thread conversion that I could use. Now, of course, I could have used um, the conversion that she offers for like DMC is to use number 12 pearl cotton for your thicker thread and to use two strands of standard um, DNC scotter. I'm talking too fast because I'm just excited. Use two strands of DMC straight up embroidery floss for the thinner thread. I'll try and speak slower. Um, London Dairy Linen Thread. I could get that from America. Didn't really want to um, at the time. Hedgehog Handiworks were still around, they sold every thread uh, known to man. But the thread that I did find in the UK, which I was thrilled about because it was different and I'd never used it before, is this stuff. And this is what I'm going to be using to, to uh, stitch that bookmark. So there's the thicker thread. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce that. And there's the um, thinner thread there. So that's exciting, I get to use new threads. And I'll be stitching that bookmark on 40 count. So that'll be fun, cutting that. So yes, I am really looking forward to that. It hopefully will be a lot of fun. And again, I want to, in exactly the same way that I spoke about with the proper thread um, sampler, the Tudor Rose sampler, when I'm using um, a book as the chart with a project, I want to treat it as sort of a learning sampler, a learning project to take my time with it, read the instructions, go slowly and make the most of it and try and produce the best um, piece of work that I can. So that is the Hardanger. And then for my latest acquisition, bit of a change to the um, two white work embroideries there is um, the pattern darning. Now I enjoy doing pattern darning. I have done two samplers that contain pattern darning, which I will show you briefly, because again, they don't get to see the live day very often. This is the first one. I should have ironed these really, They're a bit, they've been rolled up. This one is um, Reflets de Soir, um, the um, Bertha, it's probably not Bertha is it, but yeah. The name that you see at the bottom is her sampler. Um, and the panels that you can see at the bottom, they are done by using, um, doing pattern darning on them. Now, if you stitch reproduction samplers, you stitch a lot of samplers, you're probably super familiar with exactly how to do that and how it works. But just um, in case for anybody, you know, who might be new to stitching and doesn't realise how those panels are actually made, they're done by using um, a running stitch. So you might think when you look at, say, this one, with the little squares. You might think that you stitch each one of those squares singularly at a time and work across and down the pattern as you would do for an ordinary cross stitch. But what you actually do is you work, um, you have your thread um, or, of silk, in this case this was stitched with um, Soie and you basically go over and under, over and under your darning, um, up one side and down, up and down, up and down, until you create that pattern by following the chart. Um, so it's quite, it can be quite therapeutic to do. This is stitched on 40 count. I didn't really have any problems um, as long as you've got good, I'm really bad, I don't use a magnifier, but as long as you've got good light, that's essential. Um, but yeah, so that, I th this was the first darning sampler I did and I, I loved it. So then I was looking out for other darning samplers to do. And the next one I did is another Reflex de Soir. This one is um, Stephanie de Smit. This one is actually stitched in DMC. There's more, you can see there, more variation between the different darning sampler panels. 
and I just really like the texture that it can produce. Some of them are stitched in two colours of thread as you can see but even just the single ones the effect um, that you can get just by altering the length of the stitch as you go up and down up and down the length of those panels I just think is really effective and, and I really like doing it. Um, I did attempt to do another darning sampler but I think I would have gone blind doing it. Is it some of you may have, may have done them, in which case I congratulate you because I, I don't know if I could do a whole sample like this. You might not be able to see it very well. Can you see the threads? There's two colours. There's um, a one going vertically, a panel, a dining panel going vertically, and then one going horizontally. But the um, white stitching that you can... I can't remember which one I would have done first. It must have been the white. The white, um, in that central square there, what you actually do is you follow the pattern. So you do, very hard to see, you, you do your over and under, stitch the darning pattern, and then, oh, should have put it in a hoop really, you would have seen that better. And then as you went across that central square, that was just one long stitch until you got to the other side and started stitching. And then when you stitch this blue um, rectangle here, Instead of piercing the fabric to do your darning stitch, do your running stitch going up and down, you actually go over and under the white thread or the, the um, original colour thread of silk or cotton that you've used underneath. So when you look on the back of the piece, can you see there's actually no thread there at all on the back. It's all been woven over and under there at the front. So it's a fabulous effect, but it just did my head in and I was like, no, time is too short. So I will, at some point, potentially go back to trying to do that but back to this one so I knew I would love this book I desperately wanted it when I saw that Yvette um, was coming out with it because I, I knew I would stitch things from it and it was a technique I wanted to learn more about more importantly and I knew that the research she'd put into it would be phenomenal and I was eagerly anticipating it which is why I was so excited when I found out that I didn't have to wait until November to get it um, it was published um well, it's, it's been published um, in Australia, where Yvette's from, um, for longer than it was here. So originally on Amazon, the release date was November, but then they sent me an email to say they'd be shipping it in July, so that was good. Um, again, I'll put up the um, contents page. Same layout as before. You've got your background, your history, everything you need to know about the fabric and thread you need to use. You've got all the projects, and then the stitch and techniques, and the um, fabric and thread compatibility which is fantastic resource in this book and again you've got the pattern sheets at the back there for all the projects so I'm going to put up a picture of the project that I want to stitch from this it's a table runner unfortunately I have an order in for some very special threads for it but they haven't arrived so if by the time I edit this video I say I I didn't edit these videos um I have a, somebody else that does that for me um I'll put up a picture of the threads because they're wool threads. I've never used wool threads in any of my work before. I'm very excited at the fact I could find them in the UK at a small little quilting shop that's based online, so I'm thrilled about that. Um, there is another um, project in here that I desperately want to do, which is the band sampler. I cannot find the threads it requires anywhere, but there is, as I mentioned, a fantastic section in here. I'll just show it to you quickly there which basically is a vet going through all the different threads that you could use showing you a stitch sample in black on white fabric and then rating it as to how good thick or you know thick or thin or good it is to use for um this particular type of work this norwegian darning embroidery and she also does it across different counts so i mean there isn't any excuse I could technically go and convert them into something I could find. Um, the type of thread that I want to find is the Overa Soir. It's, well, if you pronounce it as an English person, it will be fine Dobson, Dobson wool. So it's a wool thread that's um, produced by Overa Soir or made on their behalf anyway. I think the colours do correspond directly to other thread colours in the Avera Soir range, I don't know. If you have any idea where I could potentially source those threads in the UK, I'd be eternally grateful. I don't particularly want to get them from America, it would cost me a fortune. Yvette does have a beautifully packaged kit for that particular band sampler. 
I've seen somebody who has it on Instagram because she's a fabulous, fabulous lady who is based in New Zealand, I think, but she went and saw a vet at, um, they had a quilt show and um, she bought, got to um, see a vet and bought the full kit from her. The kit is expensive. That's, it's not that that I've got issue with. I'm not that I made of money or anything, but what I mean is what frightens me more is the fact that it, I could pay that grand sum of money and it might not reach me. Just that doesn't sit well with me. So that's why I wouldn't necessarily want to buy the kit directly from a vet. Um, but yeah. So I probably talked at great length. I have this video is going to take days to upload to YouTube. Um, and I've probably spoken really quickly because I get excited about these things. And to be honest, I haven't really been excited about stitching for a long time. So I guess that's a good thing. One thing I will say, if you want to know any more information about either the Hardanger book by Yvette or about the um, Sardinian Knotted Embroidery by Yvette, definitely go and check out Mary Corbett's website. She has done an extensive review where you can see more pictures inside the book. I didn't want to, to show a lot of pictures because obviously for copyright reasons, um, that wouldn't be a good idea. But on Mary's site and um, where she's done the review for Yvette's books, you can see everything and get her opinion. Mary Corbett, in my opinion, I call her the Oracle because there is nothing that woman doesn't know about um, embroidery. If you are interested in any type of embroidery or thread work at all, you have to go um, onto her blog. The information that, that is on there is, is priceless and it's available for free to everyone. And it, it just makes you, you can get lost there basically. You can spend hours on that website looking at everything. So I'm sure if you're an experienced needle worker who's been around for many years, you are well aware of Mary's work. Um, but for any new stitchers that might be watching, if you're interested in any sort of embroidery at all, her website is the most fantastic resource. And she also has extensive reviews on all sorts of embroidery, textile and publications such as this one, more of which will be featured in my next video. So if you've got to the end of this, thank you so much. I hope everything was clear that I didn't speak too fast. I probably did. Um, but that is my little um, insight into the publications I enjoy using, ones that I'm excited to use in the future and that I will be stitching from in the future. So watch this space and hopefully that will happen. So thank you ever so much if you've managed to get to the end of this. I will be filming another video, which I'm sure I will speak equally quickly in and will be totally overly enthusiastic about regarding my other embroidery books, which I love with a passion, but owning embroidery books does not mean that you can actually do the embroidery held within them, which will be something I will be discussing um, during that video. So thank you for watching and happy stitching.